Linda Est Carthago. No states, no nations ever met in arms greater in strength or richer in resources. These powers themselves had never been in so high a state of efficiency or better prepared to stand the strain of a long war. And yet, great as was their strength, the hatred they felt towards each other was almost greater. The Punic Wars, Part 1, The Prelude. Welcome to Flashpoint History, Time Periods That Changed the World. This is going to be the first of a multi-part series on the Punic Wars, a struggle between Rome and Carthage that was so titanic it was fought for nothing less than dominance of Western civilization. I'd like to thank everybody for their time and for listening, and I want you guys to be aware that there is actually a video component to this podcast that is available on YouTube. So for those of you so inclined, by all means, go to Flashpoint History on YouTube. And for those of you who are already there, be advised that if you want to take this podcast to go, you can download it off the site. Both of those links are going to be available below. Either way, if you like what you hear, give me a like, leave a couple of good comments or some feedback, and spread the word about the podcast. Again, thank you for your time and for listening. I'm a very big fan of George S. Patton, you know, the World War II general, but it's not for the same reason that most people might think. Now, I know I'm going to get some bad feedback from this, but I would have to say that the man was a very good general, but I don't think he was a great general. And the reason I say he was a good general is that he was a pioneer when it came to mobile warfare. The guy was up there with kind of Heinz Gadir, and he knew the potential of the tank. He had audacity written throughout his entire character. He knew that he had to press the offensive and keep the enemy on the run. He was a motivator of people. He understood logistics. He came from a family background of warfare. You know, his forefathers fought in the American Civil War as generals, granted on the Confederate side, but still. And the man lived for warfare. But at the same time, in almost all of his confrontations, he had the advantage when it came to manpower and materiel. And also, almost always, he had either naval or air supremacy. So I think, to me, what makes a great general is somebody who is able to pull out victory even when they are outgunned and outmanned, and they're running low on supplies. You know, I think of people like Robert E. Lee, who pulled out a incredible flanking maneuver at Chancellorsville, taking on an army twice his size. Or I think of Rommel, who was actually able to rally his troops that were retreating from the British and throw them directly at the Americans at Kasserine Pass and pull off a victory. Nah, the reason I like Patton is because of his idiosyncrasies, his eccentricities. And how does that old phrase go? What's the difference between somebody who's eccentric and somebody who's crazy? It's how much money they have. I just love the way the guy thought. He believed that he was a reincarnated warrior, that he had fought alongside the Romans and alongside Napoleon in past lives, and he used that same knowledge in the present era. He was also somebody that was incredible when it came to these just absolutely fantastic sayings. You know, he was renowned as saying, the purpose of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other poor bastard die for his country. He was also quoted as saying that if he was ever stuck between the Russians and the Germans, he'd make it a point to attack in both directions. There was one phrase that he said that I don't think quite got as much limelight, and it comes from the movie that was named after his namesake, so some of this might be from Hollywood, but I don't think it's too far from his character. I had to dig deep to actually find the exact movie line. Now, this is a line that comes from later in the movie, He's talking to one of his subordinates about how he can topple the Third Reich. And what I think he's really referring to is his own glory. Quote, I had a dream last night. In my dream, it came to me that right now the whole Nazi Reich is mine for the taking. I was nearly sent home in disgrace. Now I have precisely the right instrument at precisely the right moment in history in exactly the right place. This too will change very quickly, like a planet spinning off into the universe. A chance like this won't come again in a thousand years, end quote. 
To me, what is so striking about this line is it kind of gives an insight into what Patton thought about the Second World War. It's almost exactly what John Milton was allegedly quoted as saying about Alexander the Great. He said that when Alexander saw the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there were no more lands for him to conquer. I think for both of these men, it wasn't just simply the idea of attacking somebody. It wasn't just warfare for warfare's sake. They needed to command a large force where there were extremely high stakes. There had to be a glorious cause. And most importantly, they had to be going up against a worthy opponent. Alexander, after all, had his Persian Empire and the forces under Darius, whereas Patton had his Third Reich. And I question how much job satisfaction would Patton have if he was in command of American forces when they went into Granada, or when they invaded Panama. Patton represents the eternal soldier, a person fighting in great conflicts throughout history to determine the course of Western civilization. And that's why I think you could pluck him out of the Second World War and put him into that great confrontation between Carthage and Rome, and he would have fit in just perfectly. And that's what makes the Punic Wars so incredibly special in my mind, because it is the embodiment of what Patton is. It was a war that was fought over an extended period of time. From beginning to end, it was over a hundred years. It was fought with massive forces. It was fought for the course of Western civilization and led to the extinction of another culture. And most importantly, it was fought between worthy adversaries. It was punctuated by titanic battles. Battles that would be inscribed into the pantheon of what even modern military strategists have to read in order to be accomplished. There were blood feuds. There were oaths taken by sons to fulfill the obligations of their fathers on both sides. One of the best parts is that our story begins almost like a movie preview. Because it begins with the destruction of the great empire established by Alexander the Great. And like with most movie previews, you start with that line... In a world, in a world where Alexander the Great had an army under his control, one of the finest armies inherited to him by his father, Philip of Macedon. And with this army, he decided to challenge the greatest empire of its day, the Persians. He was able to kick the Persians out of Asia Minor, push into the Middle East. He went into Egypt to establish the foundations of the Ptolemaic dynasty, and then pressed onward through Babylon deep into India. But he was a man that was destined only to live to the age of 32. And with his death, his mighty empire crumbled and then divided. But not all was to be lost, for in the West, a new empire was rising, and that empire would be known as Carthage. (laughs) Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Carthage. Well, Carthage was a trading outpost that was established by the Phoenicians, who were a group of traders from modern-day Lebanon. They initially came from a city by the name of Tyre, And while militarily unaggressive, they were extremely aggressive when it came to any type of commercial venture. You know, it's stated that the Phoenicians actually went throughout the Mediterranean basin. They actually went out through the Straits of Gibraltar and established colonies on the west coast of Africa and all the way up through Spain. If you think about it in terms of strategic commercial positioning, the central portion of the North African coast in what is modern-day Tunisia, a portion of land that actually kind of juts out into the Mediterranean, is an ideal location for the establishment of a colony. All trade going back and forth would have to stop off at that point. Now, Carthage wasn't the first city to be established there, but it gained prominence very quickly. It was stated that Carthage was established in the year 814 BCE by Dido, who was daughter of the upper class in Tyre. She was actually being persecuted by the aristocracy and decided to flee and establish her own city. Now, once Carthage established a foothold, it began to expand very rapidly. The first major target made sense. It would kind of solidify its hold on North Africa, and so it took on the Numidians and the Libyans and kind of established a power base with them. But Carthage also had the ability to expand via the sea because it had such excellence when it came to naval superiority. And so places like Corsica and Sardinia quickly became Carthaginian colonies. Carthage tried to go for Sicily as well and was able to establish a couple of outposts on the western coast of it, but 
Unfortunately, he was defeated at the Battle of Himera in 480 BCE, and that kind of stopped Carthaginian expansion eastward. Instead, Carthage turned its attention to establishing colonies in Spain. And by the 5th century, Carthage had this incredibly vast trade network throughout the Mediterranean. She had these outposts that just kind of dotted the entire coastline. And by 300 BCE, when Carthage and Rome were beginning to step on each other's feet, Carthage was truly the master of the Western Mediterranean. And compared to Rome, it was larger in size, it was wealthier, and it had a navy, which Rome didn't even consider at that point. Carthage's rise to power wasn't always without trouble, though. It tried again to take out Sicily, because if you think about it, if you're establishing a trade empire throughout the entire Mediterranean, you need to have Sicily in your back pocket. It's smack dab in the center. It controls basically all the sea lanes, etc. This second attempt, however, to retake the island of Sicily in its entirety was met with complete disaster, because Carthage had to go toe-to-toe with a man by the name of King Agathocles. Agathocles is kind of a rags-to-riches kind of guy who would do just about anything in order to secure power. He was somebody that was so politically vicious that Machiavelli actually has a chapter dedicated to him. You know that comedy routine by Jeff Foxworthy where he says, you know you're a redneck if, and there's a whole bunch of different phrases. I guess the historical adaptation to that would be, you know you're a cruel, bloodthirsty tyrant if Machiavelli gives you a thumbs up and has a chapter in his book dedicated to you. Now, this comes from Chapter 8 of The Prince, which is entitled, Of Those Who By Their Crimes Come to Be Princes. And I quote, It cannot be called prowess to kill fellow citizens, to betray friends, to be treacherous, pitiless, irreligious. Still, if the courage of Agathocles in entering into and extricating himself from dangers be considered, together with his greatness of mind and enduring, overcoming hardships, it cannot be seen why he should be esteemed less than the most notable captain. Nevertheless, his barbarous cruelty and inhumanity with infinite wickedness do not permit him to be celebrated among the most excellent men. End quote. Agathocles was born kind of towards the lower rung of society. But what he lacked in money, he more than made up for with ambition. He attempted not just once, but twice, to overthrow the Greek city-state of Syracuse, which is located in the southeast corner of Sicily. In both of these situations, he had to literally run for his life. While he was in exile, he went to the Carthaginians for help. And with Carthaginian backing, he actually raised a Greek army, which he used to return to the city of Syracuse, overthrow their democracy, and establish himself as dictator. Now, he killed anybody that got in his way, whether they be political rivals, military opponents, or your average citizen. Of course, after he was able to conquer Syracuse, the city itself was not going to be enough. Agathocles decided to turn on his Carthaginian allies, the same ones that helped him raise an army in the first place. In fact, he attacked him with such gusto that he almost pushed him completely out of Sicily. And he got so good at attacking Carthaginians that in the year 310, he decided to invade North Africa and go after Carthage itself. Now, he was kind of unsuccessful with this, and he eventually had to return back to Sicily. But he left a legacy of war between the city-state of Syracuse and Carthage. But in a larger sense, he was actually a buffer zone between Rome and Carthage. Now, in the year 289, Agathocles dies and Syracuse is left without a tyrant. Of course, it's still at war with Carthage, so it calls on a man by the name of Phyrus of Epirus. And we're going to get to him in a little bit, but just remember his name for the time being. Now, before we talk about how Phyrus brought our two contenders for world domination together, it's probably a good idea to talk a little bit about the government and military system of Carthage. Carthage was originally established as a monarchy, But in time, it became an oligarchic republic, which meant that it had annually elected officials, but these officials usually came from the upper rung of society and were usually put in charge based on how much wealth they had. The executive branch, so to speak, of the Carthaginian government, their president, was known as a suffet, or in the Latin version, suffets. There was a very close association between religion and government, which meant that if you were an elected official, you also had to serve some sort of religious function as well. 
Very much like the Roman Senate, the Carthaginian government also had a grand council, which consisted of 104 judges and 30 elders, who kind of came up with the legislative portion of what the Carthaginian government was going to do. Now, if there was an issue that came up between the Grand Council and the Suffets, a group known as the Popular Assembly would intercede. The Popular Assembly also had the distinction of being the ones that appointed generals and admirals in the situation of any Carthaginian war. And this is kind of a distinction from the Roman system, which we're going to get to in just a little bit. One of the major drawbacks in Carthaginian society was that it was not willing to give out citizenship very well. In fact, it gave it out very sparingly. It was kind of greedy when it came to this. And as a result, it didn't develop that sense of loyalty with its client states that Rome did. And this was going to be something that was going to haunt Carthage later down the line. But Carthage did have a certain degree of social mobility that didn't exist within Rome. In Rome, you were either born a plebeian or a patrician, and that kind of determined how far you were going to go, at least initially. In Carthage, it was based entirely on your wealth. And whether you made that money in this lifetime or whether the money in your pocket was old money, it didn't matter. The more money you had, the better spot you had in society. And as a result, doors within the Carthaginian government would be open to you. One of the other major distinctions between Carthage and Rome was that commerce was emphasized. Like I just said, the more money you had meant that you were a better person. Carthage never emphasized that sense of duty to the state through military endeavor. It just wasn't part of it. In fact, in almost all of Carthaginian wars, a majority of its army consisted of mercenaries. Let's talk about this for a second, because the Carthaginian military, its army, was initially based on the Greek phalanx. And at this point in history, the phalanx was kind of losing its efficacy, so the Carthaginians, along with other groups, were experimenting with things like heavy cavalry, elephants, war chariots. The Carthaginian citizen military was actually a very small force. It consisted of citizen soldiers who were only obliged to serve in situations of emergency, and usually for home defense when Carthage itself was in trouble. In retrospect, it makes the Carthaginians come across as a bunch of pansies, but they actually had a very capable fighting force. Again, most of their military consisted of very well-trained mercenaries. And this would include people like the Libyans, who actually supplied the largest contingent of most Carthaginian armies. And they would supply infantry. Or you would have Numidians, who were known for their fast, light cavalry. Spaniards would also be employed, who would supply heavy infantry, with short, thrusting swords, which were the basis of the gladius. And if you've seen any Roman movie out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the sword of the Roman legion. You'd also find contingents of Gallic warriors that would be both infantry and cavalry. So if you think about it, the Carthaginian forces were this multinational force, kind of like the UN of the ancient world. Except whereas the UN would provide defense and humanitarian aid, the Carthaginians would usually be going in to invade and conquer and expand their empire. And whereas most members of the modern-day UN would be citizen soldiers from various states, the forces of the Carthaginians would be bloodthirsty sellswords that would usually sell out to the highest bidder. But that said, I want you guys to keep in mind that even though you were dealing with forces from multiple countries that all spoke different languages, and that could seem kind of daunting to kind of combine them into a military force, in actuality... These forces provided a certain degree of versatility on the battlefield. And all it required was a really good general to really fully utilize that capacity. And once fully utilized, that force was dynamite. Strangely enough, Carthage really couldn't understand this potential until well into the First and more specifically in the Second Punic Wars. But where Carthage really shined was with its navy. Now again, Carthage was a mercantile power and its entire system was based on established trade routes, so it had to create a way of protecting those routes. Their ships were made out of the best material, they had the most excellent training, and the harbor systems that they had were just kind of unparalleled. In fact, the harbor at Carthage was a marvel of engineering. It could house 180 boats, it could deploy them in a matter of a few hours. If you go to Google Earth and you look down on Tunis, you can actually see the remnants of that harbor, even to this day. 
but we're going to be covering the Carthaginian navy in more detail in a little bit of time. The take-home message was that at this particular point in history, Carthage was in her prime. She was this contender that basically dominated the Western Mediterranean. Everybody knew about Carthage. Nobody messed with Carthage. She had a military, she had a navy, she had a government system that was almost unrivaled. Almost. Because across the water in the Italian peninsula, Rome was also rising to power. So if you buy into the founding myth, Rome was founded in the year 753 BCE by a set of brothers by the names of Romulus and Remus. According to the legend, Romulus and Remus were kind of cast out of humanity. They were thrown into the woods, left to die, where they were found by a she-wolf that raised them and nursed them back to health. And the idea was that their harsh upbringing instilled in them and the Roman character in general this idea of unquenchable desire to survive and what's more an extreme sense of duty and discipline. However, Romulus and Remus didn't always see eye to eye. They had disagreements about how the city should be created and so there was a fight between the two of them. Romulus killed Remus and became the first king of Rome. So Rome, much like Carthage, started off as a monarchy. That is up until the year 509 BCE when the last king of Rome was actually expelled, at which point it became the Roman Republic. Rome was essentially just a collection of villages on the Tiber. And it wasn't until the 6th century when those villages started to coalesce into what we think of as a city. There is a proverb in Latin. It's a Roman proverb. It goes... Deus fortoribus adesse, which means the gods are on the side of the stronger, kind of along the same lines as fortune favors the bold. What's surprising about Rome's growth from being this collection of villages to a city to expanding out into the rest of the Italian peninsula was that Rome nearly got wiped out on several different occasions. And it's kind of hard to think about it in that way because you always think of Rome as being the eternal city the founder of a great empire. But at this point, it was the newcomer on the block. It was the new kid. And it was the kid that kept getting beat up. It literally had to claw for every inch that it got. But with every black eye, with every bruise, with every cut, Rome learned. And more importantly, it continued to expand. Keep in mind that central Italy at this point in time, when Rome was growing up was actually a very rowdy, vicious neighborhood. The Roman people had to deal with threats from pretty much every angle. Surrounding Rome were a set of city-states that kind of dotted the western seaboard of central Italy and along the river Tiber. These city-states, known as the Latin League of Cities, was constantly fighting with one another, including with Rome, for scarce resources, of which the city of Vey was Rome's biggest pain. While it was dealing with that, there were a group of tribes in the Apennine Mountains known as the Oscan people that would constantly come down from the mountains and raid various fields and smaller villages. And then, in the year 390, a group of Gauls from France descended down into central Italy, managed to penetrate into the city of Rome and sack it. But like I said before, Rome learned from its mistakes. It was able to, one by one, incorporate all the cities of the Latin League under its jurisdiction. Even the city of Vey became part of the Roman hegemony. And then it was able to push out the Oscan tribes and other various barbarian groups that inhabited the Apennine Mountains and pacify that area. And after the sacking by the Gauls, the Romans rebuilt their city, and this time they installed a series of fortifications and walls. Rome wouldn't be sacked again for 800 years. The real genius to Roman expansion, because after all, Rome continued to expand. It took out the rest of central Italy. It moved into an area known as Campania. But the secret to its success was that it was willing to extend citizenship to areas that it conquered, specifically to areas that were loyal to the system. These client states quickly realized that they actually had something to gain from 
joining up with the Roman system, that Roman citizenship and Roman hegemony wasn't really that bad of a thing, that combining their forces and having a united front and providing for the common defense of everyone could actually benefit everyone. And this, by the way, was also one of the selling points of the U.S. Constitution when the 13 colonies were deciding to come together. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that this coalition that Rome nurtured and fostered and kind of coaxed into being would be one of its saving graces. This colonel, this group of loyal city-states would save Rome time and time again and would make Rome a contender for world domination in the future. Now, in the latter part of the 4th and most of the 3rd century, Roman expansion really took off. And this was part and parcel to the Samnite Wars. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about these because the Samnite Wars, you could probably have an entire podcast onto them just by themselves. But there were three major wars. And, of course, as the name implies, it was going up against the Samnites, who are a group of very vicious southern Italians. What would happen would be the Samnites would attack Rome, Rome would push back, claim a lot of their territory, create a peace alliance of some sort, of which the Samnites would either renege or attack Rome again. It kind of brings to mind the 1942 State of the Union address that FDR gave, where he basically stated that, you know, they started this war, but we can finish it. Now, in the end, by the year 292, everything in Italy south of the rivers Arno and Rubicon were under Roman control, except for a handful of city-states in the Italian boot known as Magna Graecia. These were a collection of Greek colonies that kind of held out. And as Rome never had anything easy going for it, it would have to fight yet another war against a man by the name of Phyrus in order to secure this. But for the time being, just remember Phyrus's name. We're going to get back to him in just a second. For the sake of being complete, I think it's kind of important that we take a break from the strategic situation and we talk a little bit about the Roman government and military system. I'm not going to go into exquisite detail about this, but for those of you who are watching the video, it's outlined pretty nicely in that. However, I encourage people to look deeper into this because it'll give you a deeper insight to the decision-making process that occurred throughout the war. The Roman Senate is going to sound really familiar. It is, after all, what the American system of government is actually based off of. There were three major assemblies that were associated with the Senate. The first one was known as the Comitia Censurata. And this was responsible for declaring war and negotiating peace treaties, but it also had the very definitive role of choosing consuls, praetors, and censors, who were the executive members of the government. Another branch of the government consisted of the Comitia Tributa, which was responsible for creating and passing legislation. And then, finally, you have my favorite assembly, which was the Concilium Plebis. This was the popular assembly. It consisted of ten tribunes of the people. Now, keep in mind that in Roman society, you had the plebeians, who were the lower class, and then you had an upper class, who were known as the patricians. This assembly, again, the Concilium Plebis, was designed into the system in order to prevent aristocratic oppression. It's not a bad idea if you think about it. The Roman government had a system that prevented the 1% from just basically taking over and doing whatever they wanted to. I believe that this was a very important aspect of the Roman government because in Roman society, you didn't have very much social mobility. If you were born a plebeian, you were going to die a plebeian. There wasn't any way you could move into the patrician class. The Romans also had a legacy system, which meant that if you were part of the aristocracy and you served within the Senate, then all of your progeny down the line were expected to serve within the Senate as well. It wasn't kind of an elected position. This, of course, did change over time. By the 3rd century, it was actually common to have plebeians serving within the Senate. In fact, there was a term known as novus homo, which meant new man. And these were people that weren't part of the legacy system that were new to the Senate. And there were actually some very notable characters, like Cato the Elder and Cicero, that were considered new men. The most important aspect of the Roman government, however, were the consuls. These were the executive branch. It was kind of like their version of a president, except there were two of them. 
because Romans feared the idea of having just one person in charge. They didn't want to have a king. They didn't want to have a tyrant. Though there were certain situations when Rome was up to its eyeballs in trouble when it would elect a dictator for a short period of time. Now, the most important aspect, the, the real take-home message that I want to convey is that these consuls were only elected for one-year periods of time. And during those time periods, they were expected to not only run the government, but they were also expected to command armies in the field of battle. For a second, just kind of ponder this. Because you have to be kind of an aggressive personality just to make it to consul. But once you're there, you've given one year in order to make or break yourself. You got that one year to lead armies into the field of battle in order to achieve some sort of glory. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that would make someone kind of neurotic in order to achieve their megalomania. But it does explain a lot to why the Roman character was so aggressive when it came to their expansion. And speaking of expansion, it wasn't just the aggressive Roman mentality that allowed Rome to dominate the map. It was the Roman army. The Roman army was initially based off the Greek hoplite army, but during its wars to subjugate central Italy, it transformed. It went from being a short-term militia to a standing conscript army. There was a tremendous amount of military law and harsh discipline that was imposed, and as a result, the Roman army became bigger, larger, and better trained. One of the keys to its success was that there was a high degree of officers. Now, this allowed for better tactical control of the army during times of battle. The officers also had at their disposal a reward and punishment system. So, if a soldier did really well, they'd get special commendation, of which the highest was known as the Corona Civica, which was kind of a golden laurel that they would wear. And they would only get this if they saved the life of a fellow citizen. However, the punishment system was downright draconian. If a contingent of the Roman army didn't do well, they'd have to face things like decimation, where every tenth man would die. And it would usually be at the hands of their own soldiers. You know, for that matter, pretty much any lapse in duty would be punished severely. You'd either get beaten or flogged, crucified. And if you got caught sleeping at your post, well, you'd get the death sentence for that one. Now, like I said before, a Roman army was led by a consul and would usually consist of two Roman legions and two allied legions known as the Alla. This would be approximately about 20,000 men. However, in times of crisis or war, this could be expanded up to almost 40,000. Now, let's talk about the most important aspect of the Roman army, which was the Roman legion. Now, I'm going to come at you with a bunch of names and facts and numbers, and it's probably going to make your head spin. So, again, I'm going to shamelessly promote my video. If you take a look at that, it explains it pretty well. The Roman legion consisted of three lines of heavy infantry. The first line was known as the Hastati, which were kind of the youngest men. The second line consisted of the Principes, which were men that were considered in the prime of their life, you know, between the ages of 20 and 30. The third line was known as the Triarii and were the older and the most experienced men. Each line consisted of 10 maniples. Now, each maniple was about 120 to about 160 men. If you want to think about it in terms of modern military, each maniple was about the size of a company. Now, each maniple was also divided up into two centuries, which were led by a senior officer known as a centurion. If you took three of the maniples and you put them together, you'd have a unit known as a cohort. Now, aside from the three lines of heavy infantry, there would also be a group known as the Velites, which were kind of poorer citizens, but they would serve in the role as support light infantry. And finally, with every Roman legion, you'd have a contingent of cavalry, which would be about three to 500 horsemen of the wealthiest citizens known as the equestrian class. So, if we're doing our math right, there'd be about 3,000 heavy infantry backed up by about 1,200 light infantry and three to 500 cavalry. So, for simplicity's sake, it'd be about 5,000 people per legion. And what do these 5,000 people use on the field of battle? Because one of the most imposing aspects of the Roman army was that they had standardization of their equipment. And 
Roman legionnaires actually had some really good stuff. They each had a shield known as a suctum, which it was an oval shield which consisted of layers of plywood and calfskin backing. They were bracketed by a metal frame which made them extremely sturdy and resilient. Their heads would be protected by bronze helmets, their legs would be protected by bronze greaves, and the body would have this linked ring armor which made stabbing a legionnaire very difficult. Now, each one of these guys would also have a Spanish sword known as a gladius. It was kind of a short thrusting sword which made it ideal for close quarter combat. And finally, they would all be equipped with these heavy javelins known as pilums. A Roman army employing its tactics on the field of battle was quite an impressive sight. This was a departure from the Greek phalanx, which was kind of a square body of guys with long spears that would march directly into the enemy and attack them straight on. Instead, if you had a bird's eye view of what a Roman legion actually looked like, you would notice that the various maniples were arranged in a checkerboard pattern. And this was done for increased flexibility of movement. It gave greater line of sight for succeeding lines of infantry. On the flanks, you would have your cavalry. And what you would do is you would arrange your legion so that from one end to the other would be approximately 400 meters across. And with this force, you would march within about 30 meters of the enemy, at which point your frontline troops would release their heavy javelins, the pilums, into the enemy. If you were really lucky, you'd manage to skewer an enemy right then and there, but pilums were actually intended to embed themselves in enemy shields and kind of bend off to the side. This made it very difficult for the enemy to hold on to their shields, and in many situations, the enemy would actually have to discard the shields right before the Roman legion would pounce on them with their swords. Most historians would agree that most of the casualties that happened during ancient warfare didn't actually occur when two sides were kind of face-to-face -face grinding into one another. Most of the casualties would actually occur when one side lost its cohesion, broke, and ran. And in the confusion, the other side would just mop them up. So maintaining a unit's cohesion was probably about the most important thing a commander could do on the field of battle. And that by the way, it doesn't apply just to Roman legions. That applies to just about anything. Now, this is something that the Roman army actually really excelled at. That checkerboard pattern that I'd mentioned earlier allowed for a Roman commander to have a great degree of flexibility. Plus, the high proportion of officers that were directly tied into frontline troops allowed for greater tactical control. So, when a Roman commander saw an opening in the front lines or a gap he could actually plug in maniples and cohorts into the gap and prevent his army from being routed. However, brute force and tactical control wasn't the only thing that the Roman army really excelled at. If you look at the way that the Greeks fought, which were kind of the military precursor of the Romans, they used the Greek phalanx, and they used the same tactics for hundreds of years, and it didn't really change. Romans were willing to evolve. Adrian Goldsworthy, who is the author of The Punic Wars, actually has a really good statement about this. Quote, It was a striking feature of the Romans, especially in their military enterprises, that they were willing and able to learn from their opponents and adapt. End quote. I truly believe that if the Romans didn't have this capacity to actually learn and try new things, they probably wouldn't have done quite so well during The Punic Wars. All right, so at the risk of sounding just a little redundant, I figure we might as well rehash the strategic situation at this point. As I've been kind of drilling into everybody's head, Carthage, Rome, growing in size, becoming big, big contenders for the world throne. Carthage now owns most of Tunisia, vast parts of North Africa, Sardinia, Corsica, portions of Spain. Tried moving into Sicily, wasn't quite successful. But Carthage still has her trade empire. She's doing well, rich, wealthy, in her prime ready to expand further to the north. And then you got Rome. The upstart contender has taken over all of central Italy, he's starting to push down, took on the Samnites, put them in their place, and is ready now to expand further. But think about it. There's always been some sort of buffer zone between these two major powers, right? First time Carthage tried to go into Sicily, it got beaten back at the Battle of Himera by the Greeks. Second time it tried to take over Sicily, it got pushed back by King Agathocles. And now you have these Greek colonies that are known as Magna Graecia, which are in Sicily and portions of southern Italy and the Italian boot, 
that are still in the way. What happens when that buffer zone goes away? These two massive empires are now next door neighbors. Well, there would be one more major conflict before that would happen. And that would involve a man by the name of Phyrus. Phyrus is somebody that I personally find really interesting, but at the same time, I kind of feel sorry for the guy. In the grand pantheon of would-be megalomaniacs, he's the guy that kind of gets the booby prize. And it's not because of, you know, lack of character or lack of ability. It's just kind of how the historical dice kind of rolled for him. This is a man that in the year 297 BCE became the king of an area northwestern Greece known as Epirus. Because, you know, that's what megalomaniacs do. And if you're wondering where he got his self-absorption from, well, he was the second cousin to Alexander the Great. So, you know, he had kind of a lot to live up to. Now, by the year 282, Rome was really encroaching in on southern Italy. It was really beginning to step in on the feet of those colonial Greek city-states known as Magna Graecia. One city-state in particular, the city-state of Tarentum, which is located in the heel of the Italian boot, really felt a lot of pressure from Rome. And to be fair, Rome did break a treaty with them. It sailed ships in spots where Roman ships weren't supposed to be. In any case, Tarentum felt enough pressure that it began to call for aid from just about anyone. And Phyrus being the type of guy that he was, who would never back down from a challenge, and don't forget about the megalomania, answered Tarentum's call. In 280, he manages to pack up his army, sailed across the Adriatic, and land at Tarentum. And then he proceeds to march the army across land towards the Roman city of Heraclea. And near the city of Heraclea, at the river Cirrus, he meets up with his first Roman army. Both forces kind of create a battle line and then go toe-to-toe. And at one point, Phyrus is nearly pushed off the field of battle when the Romans induce a flanking maneuver with their cavalry on Phyrus' left flank. But... At the last second, Phyrus decides to unleash a secret weapon. Now, imagine yourself as a Roman legionnaire. You're sitting there on the field of battle, you're covered in blood. You got a sword in one hand and you can stab with the best of them, right? Suddenly, on your right flank, you see these ginormous objects that are heading towards you. They're huge. They're kind of like a horse, except they're gray and they're five times bigger and heavier. And they have these strange trunks that are hanging out of them. So, whereas the Romans decided to bring horses to the field of battle, Phyrus decided to bring war elephants. And the Romans had absolutely no answer to this whatsoever. They got stomped on. Historians say that the Romans lost about 15,000 plus during this battle. And if you think about it, a Roman consular army consisted of about 20,000 men, so if you do the math, there's really not that many Romans left that are running back to Rome. Now, being the type of guy that Phyrus was, he wasn't going to let a good opportunity go away. He basically chased the remnants of that army almost back to the very gates of Rome itself. That winter, he camped out in an area of Italy known as Campania. To give you an idea of how successful he was, he was approximately a two-day march on Rome at this point. But that is about as close to Rome as Phyrus was going to get. Because in the grand scheme of things, his major grand strategy failed him. Phyrus was desperately counting on the city-states of the Italian peninsula to defect to his side and provide him with reinforcements. But like I had mentioned to you before, Rome extended citizenship to these people. And as a result, they remained fiercely loyal to the Roman system. As a result, Phyrus never got reinforcements, and from here on out, every loss that he would have on the battlefield would really count against him. But he wasn't the type of guy that was going to let something small like, you know, no reinforcements stop him. In the spring of 279, he renewed his offensive against the Roman state. He marched his forces to the east, where he met up with another Roman force at the Battle of Asculum. Now, the Battle of Asculum was a two-day battle. The first day was inconclusive. It was more kind of a skirmish. But the second day was a horrendous clash. Phyrus was able to move his army, capture the high ground, and inflict stunning losses on the enemy. At the last second, Phyrus decided to send in his elephants in a flanking maneuver, but this time the Romans had created these wagons with 
armor kind of covering the top of them, and they were used as anti-elephant weapons. They were initially effective and almost managed to stop the elephants, but on the field of battle, almost doesn't count. And the Romans got stomped again. Technically, this was a victory for Phyrus, but he also had horrendous losses on his side as well. In fact, his losses were so bad that it was this battle that coined the term a Phyric victory. Phyrus himself said, quote, If we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. End quote. This is what I mean about winning the booby prize in history. Because in Phyrus's family, you have people like Alexander the Great that history is going to remember as being this world-conquering military genius. Whereas history is going to remember Phyrus as the poor schmuck whose name is forever going to be linked to a victory that's so costly that it basically makes you lose the war. Well, that said, most people at this point would have had the good sense to back out of Italy, go back to Greece, and call it a day. But not our boy, no. Phyrus figured that war with Rome just wasn't enough for him. He figured he was going to invade Sicily, which was held by Carthage, and declare war on them as well. Surprisingly, he was actually very successful against the Carthaginians. He managed to push them back almost entirely across the island to their last bastion of defense at the city of Lilibaeum. Which, by the way, Lilibaeum was going to be a major stronghold for the Carthaginians throughout the First Punic War as well. Strangely enough, Carthage took such a beating at Phyrus' hand that, of all people, it made an alliance with Rome. Well, I guess it was more kind of a non-aggression pact, but Carthaginian reasoning, ironically enough, was that Phyrus was the bigger threat. Now, that all said, Phyrus knew that his time in Sicily was going to be limited. He was getting no reinforcements, his supplies were running low, and eventually he had to back out and go back to Italy. Phyrus was no nincompoop. He could read the writing on the wall, and he realized very astutely that once he was no longer in the picture, there would be no more buffer zone between two great powers. Plutarch actually recorded his thoughts really well. Quote, in truth, it was because he could not master Sicily, which was like a storm-tossed ship, but desired to get out of her that he once more threw himself back into Italy. And it is said that at the time of his departure, he looked back at the island and said to those about him, My friends, what a field for the Carthaginians and the Romans we are leaving behind us. End quote. Phyrus really just didn't know when to quit. He invaded Italy yet again, took on the Romans yet again, beat him back to the city of Beneventum, gave him a black eye. There was a battle. It was inconclusive. But eventually... Phyrus realized that he couldn't stay in Italy any longer and eventually retreated back to Greece. The Romans, on the other hand, if anything, just kept growing stronger and more resolute. Plutarch actually comments on the Roman character very nicely. Quote, on the other hand, as from a fountain continually flowing out of the city, the Roman camp was quickly and plentifully filled up with fresh men, not at all abating in courage for the losses they sustained but even from their very anger, gaining new force and resolution to go on with the war. End quote. With Phyrus out of the way, Rome completed its conquest of southern Italy. In 272, Tarentum finally surrendered to the Roman Senate, and during this time, Carthage managed to take over most of Sicily. So now the stage was really kind of set. You had two massive empires that were both fiercely of the mind to keep expanding, each on each other's doorsteps, and there was no longer a buffer zone. How many times in history has such a situation existed where people were able to maintain their stability? It doesn't happen that often. There's usually a catalyst that comes along that kind of sets everything off. I can think of a couple of examples right off the top of my head. I mean, after all, how stable was Europe until June 28th? 1914, in the city of Sarajevo. How stable was the Pacific until December 7, 1941, at Pearl Harbor? The Romans and the Carthaginians had their catalyst at the city of Messina, with a group known as the Mamertines. The Mamertines were a group of thug mercenaries from the time of King Agathocles, but after his death, 
they were kind of left unemployed and didn't have anything left to do. So they were invited into the city of Messina, which is in the northeast corner of Sicily. And the idea was that they were going to provide defense for the citizens. But what they did was they turned on the citizens, slaughtered them, and then turned Messina into kind of like a pirate's enclave. And from that point onward, they became the biggest nuisance in Sicily. They began raiding sea lanes, they began attacking their next-door neighbors, but eventually their next-door neighbors fought back. In the year 265, Syracuse managed to attack and defeat them in the field of battle. And so they were defenseless, and they were desperate, and they called to Carthage for help. Carthage immediately sent a garrison in order to protect them, which was nice at first, but the Mamertines got sick of the idea of having a Carthage watchdog watching over them. And so they next called to the Romans to kick out the Carthaginians. It's kind of like making a deal with one drug cartel and realizing it didn't work for you, and so you're going to get help from another cartel. You know, it just leaves you in a very precarious position. The Roman Senate took its time in order to make its decision. There was actually some fierce debating going on, but it knew what it was doing. It knew that coming to the Mamertines' aid would be a declaration of war on Carthage. Adrian Goldsworthy of the Punic Wars actually puts this into really good perspective. Quote, Polybius represents the Roman decision to go to Sicily as shamelessly opportunistic, their awareness of the hypocrisy of assisting the Mamertines, overcome by greed for plunder and glory, backed by a concern about the potential threat posed by a Carthage fully in control of Sicily and with easy access to Italy. Dio felt that the real reason for the First Punic War was the mutual fear in both Carthage and Rome of the other's growing power. Now that Rome's conquest of southern Italy had brought their empires face to face, each believed that their only long-term security lay in weakening the other's power. End quote. And thus, after fierce debate, the Roman Senate finally decided that it would indeed come to the aid of the Mamertines, knowing all along that this would mean that Rome was going to war with Carthage. Well, that's the end of part one. In our next episode on Flashpoint history, the First Punic War will be in full swing. Rome and Carthage will finally learn what it means to go up against a first-rate power. And in the process, a Roman army will march to the very gates of the Carthaginian capital. Now, if you like what you hear, by all means, give me a like, leave some good comments, and spread the word about the podcast. If you got a chance, by all means, I'd love for you to subscribe. In either case, thank you for your time and for listening. This is Flashpoint History, time periods that changed the world. Thank you.